Well, you know, one of the words is we start on time and we end on time. So it's 730. And thank you all for joining with us. Well, God bless everybody. Welcome to our uh, Black History meeting of the the Richmond chapter of Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And uh, we're going to get this thing started off right, as we all normally do. The one thing that we do to get it started off right is we have prayer. And we open with an invocation. And one of my favorite folk to open the prayer for our meeting is our Reverend Dr. Derek L. Peterson, young man that I've known for quite some time. And I think he's a fantastic person. He does a great job down at the state. And, and he just came off a cruise, so he ought to be able to pray us up real good. Because he, he came, he came, I'm putting all your business out in the street, Rev. So, Reverend Doctor, would you please open us up with prayer, and then we'll move forward with the meeting. Thank you. Indeed. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. All right, let us pray. Lord, we gather here this evening, and we first want to say thank you. Thank you for the strength and health that has brought us through this day. We pray, God, that you give us wisdom to navigate this meeting with clarity and to collaborate effectively. Give us insight to make sound decisions and the compassion to understand one another. Guide our words and actions towards the greater good, and may we approach every challenge with grace and love. We thank you for our leadership, to continue to cover us and be with us throughout this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Reverend Doctor. Uh, what we'll do real quickly is we'll move on to the financial statement. You know, we got so much money that it takes us a long time to even talk about all the money we got in our account. So uh, Treasurer Jackie Snow is going to uh, just brief us as far as where we are on our finances. Hold on for a second. Uh, uh, there we go. Hold on. I'm going to make her, I'm going to at least pin her picture up there. Go ahead, uh, uh, Treasurer Snow. Can you tell us where we are with our finances? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, our account at the credit union went dormant after a year of no transactions because you know we're reorganizing. Uh, they started to deduct $5 per month of our then balance of $100. So our current balance is $70. And we've had a donation from Reverend Brown and Fifth Baptist Church uh, very recently for $250. So when we combine those balances, 70 plus 250, we have $320 so far. And that's it for our financial report right now. Wow, that took you a long time to tell it. Well, thank you very much. We, how, did we spend any money? Not nope. one penny. No, we haven't. We don't have any money to spend. So it makes it a little easier to, uh, to do a financial accounting, but it's not gonna always be that way. It's not going to always be that way. We're going to one day have some money that we can uh, do some good things with as far as uh, the struggle, as far as making things happen. So what we are hoping to do uh, this year is continue our voter education drive and our voter information drive. Um, we had discussed before, was one of our goals was to bring youth in and we've done that, but and we're going to continue to do that. But one of our other goals, goals was also to, uh, to make sure that we inform and educate our constituents here in the Virginia area as to why it's important to vote and what their rights are as it pertains to voting. And as you know, we did over 4,000 flyers last year. And we believe that we helped with the turnout. Um, we went to concerts, we went to schools, we went to church gatherings. We did a lot of work last year 
passing out flyers. And we used the flyer because the flyer was kind of easy for people. Once you got it in their hand and they read like, this is why you should vote and uh, here are your rights as to voting. They didn't feel as intimidated as having to answer any questions or for you to sit up and, 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 and drill them on whether they voted and whether they did not. We didn't go that route. We went the route of, here's what your rights are and here's what you can do. So we have the same thing we need to do this year with our federal election coming up. As you all know, the primary is coming up next week and it's not much that we could do about that at this point in time. We don't know how many people are gonna show up for the primary uh, here in Virginia. But what we can do is we can start exercising our influence on sharing people the importance of voting this November. Now, if you thought the election last November was important, and it was for Virginians, it was extremely important. This election coming up this November is important for the world. It's important for the for just, I don't even know how to say it. It's just so important for the world because you got a choice. And I, I don't think any of us on here have any question as to whether or not this is going to be an important election. So for that reason, um, we're going to redo our flyer. And we're going to uh, change the side that talked about Virginia voting rights to your rights as far as the federal election is concerned. And what Virginia has done to codify your ability to vote early, to vote uh, absentee, to come up and vote. I, I told you all the last time, uh, my wife and I, we've all, we since since it was available recently, we always get our ballot sent to us. And then we take our ballot to the, uh, to the polls. And uh, all before now, somebody would come to the car and take the ballot in for us and, and give us a sticker and say, well, this time the young man told us that he couldn't take the ballot in for us. So I, I mean, you know, and we're all both definitely senior citizens and, and I'm 70 uh, something years old. And so we went in and um, I went in and, and, and happened to talk to one of the poll workers, Luther knows one of the twins, the Robinson twins. And he was one of, the, he's been working the polls forever. And he explained to that gentleman right there on the spot, no, you were supposed to bring this in. He said, they, did, they shouldn't have had to get out of the car and come in here to bring this and put this uh, in the box. You were supposed to take it. And he explained that right. And that's the important part about having people working in the polls who understand your rights and who will stand up for your rights. Because had it been another situation, another circumstance, somebody would have upheld that man telling me that he, he wasn't supposed to take my ballot. But he was supposed to. And he apologized. Oh, I didn't know. I uh, Good. Now that you know, don't make that mistake again. You know what I'm saying? Do what you do what you're supposed to do. So we got some things that we're going to explain and that we're going to work on. And uh, we have some other order of business that we need to discuss as far as uh, working our charter, increasing our membership, and election of off election of officers. Uh, because this is a general meeting tonight and we're not, um, and we have a special guest on tonight, we're not going to spend that time right now talking about that. But what I will either do is I will either call a special election, uh, a special meeting for the election that is for members only. And uh, I just encourage you all to go to nationalsclc.org slash join and become a member. If you're not a member, if you're visiting with us, uh, please do become a member. We need uh, as much as possible to increase our membership. We believe that we'll be able to get some things done the more people we have working with us with SCLC. So that being said, I'm getting ready to introduce our guests. And I'm getting ready, let's see. Uh, Mr. Snow, I'm trying to unpin you because I have you pinned right here. And I'm trying to unpin you right now so that I can pin our guest. There we go. So uh, 
why don't we do this? Why don't we first of all talk about the the guests that we're going to have right today? And uh, I see two of our guests that are going to be on, and I possibly will have more. Um, many people don't know that Richmond has such a history. We talk about it here in SCLC. Richmond has such a fantastic history in the formation of SCLC and in the furtherance of the mission of SCLC. And there are four elements that play an important role in it. Virginia Union University is one of those elements. The city of Petersburg, the city of Hopewell, uh, are other elements in that, both Petersburg and Hopewell, and, and this area in general. But what they used to call the Tri-Cities, I don't know what they call it now, but it used to be called the Tri-Cities, uh, Richmond, Petersburg, and Hopewell. And there were two people in particular that I'm singling out tonight that played such an important role in SCLC from the beginning, and that is Reverend Curtis Harris of Hopewell. And that is Reverend Wyatt T. Walker of Petersburg. Now, the reason I said Virginia Union plays an important role, Reverend Dr. Derek Peterson, who recently got his doctorate from Virginia Union University, is that both of those gentlemen, uh, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker and Reverend Curtis Harris, matriculated at Virginia Union University under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Samuel Proctor. And Rock, that Dr. Proctor was a good friend of our founder, uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And those gentlemen had interacted with Dr. King in the 50s, even before 1957, when SCLC was founded, these gentlemen were working with and knowing Dr. King from his visits here in Richmond in the early 50s. And in the mid 50s, all the way up to 57 and all the way up to 1960. So this area has a profound history of working with Dr. King. And we're going to talk about that tonight because we've got people who had firsthand knowledge of that growing up and being right in the middle of that. I don't know if you saw that, but the, the little announcement I made said these people lived in, the, in, in history, they walked in history. They weren't as old now. I'm not gonna make them, I'm not gonna make neither one of them at all. And I'm not gonna tell the age of the young lady who is joining us, uh, but I might tell, tell the young man's age because he's old as I am, if not older. Um, but tonight we have uh, with us uh, the Honorable Michael Harris also a Virginia statesman, uh, Dr. Peterson and, and Brother Luther and all the other Virginia states people, statesmen people on here. And he is the son of Reverend Curtis Harris, all right? We also have right now Suzanne Walker, who is the niece of Reverend Y.T. Walker. And I must tell you right now, Reverend Walker's son, uh, Jay Walker, was supposed to be joining us, but he was here celebrating uh, Mrs. Walker's birthday party and he went back home and he thinks he has COVID at this point in time. So he's not feeling that well. I don't know if he's going to come on this evening and still uh, talk with us or not, but sister Suzanne uh, told me just a quick story and I'll let her tell you all that. But first of all, I'm going to introduce both, uh, the Honorable Michael Harris. And why do I call him Honorable Harris, Michael Harris? Because Michael Harris returned back to this area not long ago and decided to follow in the footsteps of his father and ran for city council in the city of Hopewell. And he was elected tremendously. You see, we, we did our work in November. So Michael Harris, the son of Curtis Harris, is now on the city council in Hopewell, Virginia. And he and I believe that my grandchildren actually live in his district. If not, they live a, one street over from his district. So we had that conversation about my grandkids. The Huggables are in uh, Hopewell now. 
and going to Carter G. Woodson, and uh, which is I, where I believe uh, uh, the Honorable Michael Harris went to school also. So Mike, uh, and then let me oh, introduce Suzanne Walker. I call her General Walker. Um, she was in the military, worked at the Pentagon for years, and, and I don't even know all the stuff that she did. She's a Virginia statesman also. And uh, Suzanne, was your rank Lieutenant Colonel? or What was your rank when you decided to tell the government go away? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel. I call it, I promoted her to General. You know what I'm saying? So I, I always thought that I say anybody that stay in the military that long ought to be a general in the house. So, but she's a Virginia statesman and more uh, flag officers and generals in the whole, from, right? I think that's the story that more of the H, more of the black generals in the United States Army came from Virginia State University than any other institution. So she's in good company. She, that's how, maybe that's how you got up to the Pentagon because you know people. <laughs> well, we'll see. So, so Suzanne, uh, Michael, you gonna come on camp? Well, I know you've been under the weather. Are you gonna stay off camera for right now? Or are you coming on? Oh, there he is, Mike. There's Mike. How you doing, my friend? I'm fine. Uh, well, I know you have some medical issues, but that's few up in years like I am. So we, God is good. We still here at this point in time. Let me just give you the floor first, Mike, and then I'll come back to you, Suzanne, because I want to hear that story about Daddy King, and I want everybody else to hear it. Mike, here's the deal. We don't have a lot of time because we don't mess around here at SCLC. We, we start on time, we end on time. Tell us a little bit about yourself, but tell us more of what you remember from the era when your father was, a, the, as you all saw the picture on the advertisement, this gentleman's father and Dr. King walked hand in hand in furthering and, and his father stood up and he was right there with him now, don't get me wrong. He was right there with him, standing up for justice in the United States and in Hopewell and Central Virginia, everything else. Mike, you got the floor for a few minutes. Go ahead, tell us about it. First, let me, Thank you for including me in this occasion where you are actually talking about uh, Dr. Harris. And uh, I am appreciative of everything that's said about him, about people that work with him, that knew him. Uh, and as we move forward into the future, especially here in Hopewell, right? Because I did not plan to be back here in Hopewell, but I am. And I am actually, I was actually uh, elected to the ward that he held for twenty over twenty six years. Awesome. So we that's where I am right now. Well, what it is that I know about SCLC, I go all the way back to nineteen sixty one, when I was eleven years old with uh, uh, SCLC coming on up through the years, following my father's uh, path of uh, his uh, dedication to the organization which is, you know, like you said, we just got a little bit of time. So when we started going through his chronology, it would take us for the rest of the evening. I just wanted to say that in Hopewell still, we are honoring him as a, as a matter of fact, we did that last December, the second, when we unveiled a statue in the plaza in Hopewell, right beside the, the statue that he had erected of Dr. King in that same plaza. So I, you know, in, in regards to what it is that uh, myself personally, what I feel is I feel that uh, I've missed Dr. Harris quite a bit still. We lost him back in 2017 and I miss him and still do. And uh, I just wanted to say to Ms. Walker that it was sort of like, you, it was unbelievable but about those two men, right? because they spent their last days together in Chester in an assisted living place right next to each other. And I got to re -get, re -get reacquainted with uh, uh, Reverend Walker in that, in that way. And it was really something to build. Uh, other than that, Bill, you know, I don't know what it is that you would want me to say other than what it is that he had a, he's accomplished, but it's well documented. And uh, I do want to add, though, that my sister is on 
is called, and I just would like her to say just a couple of words. I know she didn't want, I don't want to put on the spot, but she represents our family, especially in the public. And I would just like to have her say a few words if she would. I don't want to put no pressure on her, but I would like to have her just say a couple of things. And I yield to her. All right, let me let me name your sister. Where where is she on the iPhone or Samsung? It's I'm right here. Oh, oh, I don't have to do that. There's Joanne right there. I see you. All right. Well, come on here. Look, we got all three of y'all on screen right now. This is this this is historic in itself because all of you all walked right in. You know, I brag about the fact I went to the same high school Dr. King with, but you all walked right in the shadows with your parents and your relatives. And, and so go ahead, uh, Dr. Lucas, tell us a little something about uh, the history of, of uh, doc, Dr. Harris. I call him Reverend Harris, but Mike, cause I'm a minister too, but a Reb, Mike, Mike wants to be called him Dr. Harris and the Reverend Dr. Harris, I'm gonna give him all those titles. He deserves them. Uh, Joanne, Dr. Lucas, go ahead and talk a little bit about your father and the history of uh, how he and Dr. King worked together. Well, Daddy joined the uh, SCLC in 1961, and he had, prior to that, been involved in the NAACP locally in Hopewell. And But by 1961, he was on the national board. And uh, at one point, he was, I think, maybe the fourth vice president of the national. And um, I'm much younger than Michael. So um, there are things that I don't necessarily remember, but were told to me. But I can say, because I was a daddy's girl, I followed daddy around when and went wherever he would allow me to go. And I met Dr. King when I was 12. And that was um, a magnificent day. It was in uh, Suffolk, Virginia. There was a big rally at Peanut Field in Suffolk, Virginia. And I got to sit up on the platform with all of these big dignitaries from the movement. And I was sitting right directly behind Dr. King. And somebody wanted to pass Dr. King a note. So they touched me. They gave me the note to give to Dr. King. And I was just so excited because I was going to be touching Dr. King on the shoulder. And I couldn't think of a single solitary thing to say to Dr. King. I lost my opportunity to be able to speak with Dr. King. And, but I did get to sit behind him. I did get to touch him on the shoulder. I did get to uh, hand him the note, but I didn't say anything. And uh, I even have some pictures of that day of meeting Dr. King. And um, I can say that I really honestly did not understand all that was going on as far as the movement was concerned. But I remember when Dr. King passed away and I came home from school and I, 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 uh, I was in fifth grade, I think, when Dr. King passed away, fifth, sixth grade and schools had integrated and I was going to a predominantly white school in Hopewell. And I remember when um, I got out of school that day um, this little white girl was talking to another white girl and was referring to Dr. King as a nigger. And that, that, you know, they killed the nigger. And I didn't really know what they were talking about. But when I got home, it was the first time I ever saw my daddy cry. He was weeping when I got home. And so you don't always know. I mean, I knew who Dr. King was. I knew who my father was. I knew his involvement in the civil rights movement. It was always people at our house. There was always a march. There was always a meeting. There was always a lot of drinking coffee and a lot of talking going on. And, um, but I didn't understand until I was an adult, the relationship that he had with Dr. King, that they were actually friends. They knew each other, they discussed things, that it was important in the movement, not just in Hopewell, but nationally, he was important in the movement. Um, I think what I remember most about that it was his tears that day. It was, I kind of thought that it was over for black people. You know, Dr. King was dead. 
but he assured me that day that the fight was going to go on. And what I can say, the legacy in our family has been that you don't ever stop the fight. I was very impressed when my old brother decided that he was going to run for city council. I told him he was too old, but uh, he said he was going to do that anyway. And that's because the fight continues. And that is why he is doing what he's doing. That's why I, I was in public education for 36 years doing my due as far as children are concerned and what I taught. I taught in the classroom 28 years. All of this comes from Curtis Harris and what foundation he laid and what we used to say about dad. Dad didn't tell us what to do or how to act. He just did what he was supposed to do and he let us watch him do it. Oh, and that is wonderful. what I have to say about my father. Wonderful. Thank you. And and why are you calling Michael old like that? He we are, we around the same age, Virginia Statesman, he marched in the band. Suzanne, I don't know if you know this, but Michael Harris marched in the same band you marched in. And if I'm not mistaken, Mike, did you play drums? You played drums, all right? Sure did. Yeah, Suzanne played saxophone in the band at Virginia State. She was an excellent saxophonist. So Suzanne, let, let me introduce you, let you unmute your mic and let you talk a little bit about uh, the Walker family and, and just, before you move on, make sure you tell that story about your mom and daddy King that you told me earlier, but just tell us about your uncle Wyatt T. Uh, because when we first met at Virginia State 50 something years ago, you, you know, you made it sure that I knew because of the connection, because Susan, Wyatt T. Walker and my family, when I grew up, we lived on the same street in Petersburg. We lived on Dunlop Street. He lived three blocks down the street from where we lived. So I knew the family as a child. Suzanne, go ahead, dear. Tell us, tell us more and welcome to SCLC Richmond. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, my uncle, Wyatt T. Walker, we called him Uncle T. He was the youngest son. Uh, my dad was the middle son and he had an older brother and there were two other, three other sisters. So there were six children all together. But he was the youngest son, and he was um, he was the feisty one in the family. He was the rock star of the family. He was very, very bright, very smart. He was going to Virginia Union to be a, a chemistry and physics major, but he was always active, and he was a great athlete. He was a great baseball player. Later in life, he became a great golfer, uh, but he was the one that everyone was drawn to, even as a young, before he even became a college graduate. And my dad really looked up to him, even though he was the older brother. And at, during my childhood, we all knew that he was involved in a lot of important things, but really didn't understand the scope of what he was involved in. My father followed him uh, a lot, uh, you know, in terms of what he was doing. He was a little bit worried about some of the things that he was getting involved in. You know, the Freedom Riders, he was a Freedom Rider. He was also um, jailed many times. Um, I have a couple pictures if I can share my screen at some point, but, I'll, but I'm going to be brief. I'm not going to drag this out too long. But anyway, as, as a youngster, we gathered around his children. They're all, all we we're all, all of our, my cousins are this pretty much close in age. And they lived in New York uh, after they came back from Atlanta. And that's when we saw them the most, you know, and I was younger. Uh, when he was in Atlanta and Petersburg, we didn't see him that much, but that was my first introduction to Petersburg was visiting them. And he was the pastor of Guilfield Baptist Church. And uh, that was, actually something that was of a legacy when I went to Virginia State, I attended Guilfield because I was a music major and I was following Dr. Carl Harris, who was the organist at the time. Anyway, we had many opportunities to hear uh, him preach. He preached uh, as a guest minister all over Washington, D.C., in New York, in New Jersey. And my dad would always make sure we would go to the places where he was speaking. He did a... Uh, tour of duty, I guess you could say, at Abyssinian Baptist Church in the late 60s. And that's really when he had finished most of his time with SCLC and the movement and Dr. King. Uh, but when he got in, in, installed as the senior pastor of Canaan Baptist Church in Harlem, New York, Dr. King was the person who officiated his installation. And that's where I met 
I had the opportunity to meet Dr. King. So uh, it was a big family thing. The whole family was there. We were probably in church from sun up to sundown. But I, I, I was 12 years old, and I remember it vividly. The, there were so many services and celebrations of this installation as the pastor of Canaan that we had the opportunity to meet Dr. King. There were other occasions when Dr. King would be in the area speaking, and my dad would go to hear him speak. Sometimes he would take us, sometimes we didn't, but I had the opportunity to hear Dr. King speak several times. And I think the story that you're referring to is um, we had a uh, an opportunity to host Daddy King at our house for an overnight. They were coming into Philadelphia to speak at an event, a rally or something. And as you, as when they always came to town, they stayed with family. So I had an aunt that lived in Merchantville. The Uncle T would stay with her, but we always had extra folks that stayed with us. And Daddy King stayed at our house. My mother almost lost her mind trying to get the house ready, cleaned, and have the guest room ready. And we lived in a 1,200 square foot row house in the heart of Camden, New Jersey. So we didn't have any fancy stuff. But I just remember sitting on uh, the steps. We had little steps that go upstairs and, and I, it led into our dining room. And I remember sitting on the steps and Daddy King was sitting at the head of our table and my mother was fussing around, made all kinds of food and everybody was sitting around and they were talking about this big event that they were going to the next day. So that was a really uh, impactful memory that I... I have I hold dear. Uh, my uncle was very uh, involved in SCLC, as we mentioned, and he, you know, he always told us the story about how when he went to the Petersburg Library, he tried to check out a book in the white section, and the book was the biography right, of Robert E. Lee. That's right. And um, we all read that book, and we all understood why he was making that statement. And there were many instances where he would tell us these stories about things that he did and uh, how did it feel to be arrested. But on the other hand, my aunt, his wife, Aunt Anne, she was very quiet about her involvement, but she was very involved too. As a matter of fact, I didn't know that she was also a freedom writer until I was an adult. She never mentioned it. She never talked about it. He always kind of had the limelight of his involvement in the movement and what he did in Birmingham. Uh, he was instrumental in the Birmingham movement and I remember in 1968, our whole family came to DC for the Poor People's Campaign, and we walked among the tents in the tent city that was on the National Mall. Uh, we we met a lot of people at that event. Um, I think my dad went to the um, March on Washington. Uh, we did not go, but my Aunt Anne, she was sitting right on the dais with Mrs. King and Mrs. Abernathy and some others. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the pictures cut her out of the you, you know, when you look on the historical pictures, you don't see her, but she was right there kind of behind Mahalia Jackson. So all of those things I didn't realize until much later when I was an adult. And as my uncle got ill and he was, you know, realizing that he was coming towards the end of life, he, he made some key strategic decisions about what to do with his papers and his writings. And they were donated to the University of Richmond because they... Uh, had a scholar program where students today continue to learn about him and his uh, participation in the movement. And he he really wanted to make sure that the legacy and the information that he was involved in was preserved for forever for for um, for a legacy. So we do have access to a lot of his writings, his papers. He wrote many books. He wrote, he was a uh, a contributor to the African American hymnal, the Baptist hymnal, the, which is a wonderful musical collection. He did a lot of study in musicology, in uh, just a, a number of topics that he was a, a brilliant educate educator. He taught. Um, he also did a lot of community activism as an urban minister in Harlem. So he uh, created a charter school, I think it's called Solulu Walker Charter School in Harlem, uh, because the students there were not getting the proper education, H housing for senior citizens, uh, drug rehabilitation facilities, all kinds of things to really be a member of the community. He brought uh, Nelson Mandela to Harlem to, the, to speak at his church. And uh, my dad 
went to that service, we were, I think I was in college or something. I can't remember when it was, but I wasn't available to go. But my dad went, he got a chance to meet Mar um, Nelson Mandela. And there were so many other dignitaries that he knew and brought around the family or that the family had an opportunity to engage with. He was a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He was- Wait a minute, Dr. Peterson. Hold up, Dr. Dr. Peterson is is all uh, go ahead. He's he's a member. he's one of those alpha folks. Uh -huh. in, uh, same and, chapter, Gamma uh, chapter. Same very, chapter. Very proud of that. And he uh, actually worked. I see um, Mr. Ryan Bell is on here. He was very active with Mr. Bell with uh, some programs that they had at Virginia Union to recognize him and to um, uh, you know bring him some honor while he was still alive. And that was a really great day for our entire family. So there's just so much um, information that we just are very proud of him. We we are, you know, every time I go to a Baptist church, I say, have you ever heard of Y.T. Walker? That's my <laughs> uncle. <laughs> so I'm still riding on the coattails and trying to uh, to make sure that the younger generation uh, knows about him. And our, our kids and grandkids all know about my uncle and his involvement. And we're just so proud that Aunt Anne is still around and she's able to tell her story and uh, she's, she was featured at the Chester Library a couple of years ago, telling her story about what it was like for her to be arrested and put into Parchment Prison after the Freedom Rides. And who, she mentioned the people who came to get her out of, um, out of there, you know, who, who posted her bail and things like that. So she's got a lot of stories. She's, she has a, a tissue napkin that she wrote some of the things that were going on, what they ate and how they were treated. And she still has that pressed in a book. So. There's a lot of really okay. great memories about his involvement and, and it really inspired everybody else in our family and those who knew us to keep that. You have to, you have to keep it in the forefront. You cannot let things go because things will sneak up. And next thing you know, you won't have what you had. And even though you don't have everything you're supposed to have, you have to keep pushing for it. So uh, I'm just very proud to be here with you all this evening and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has a question. And I have a couple pictures if you want to see a picture. Uh, yeah, do me a favor. Go ahead and share. And, uh, Joanne and Michael, can you all come back on camera? Uh, Suzanne, go ahead and share a picture if you want to. I, I fixed it so multiple people could share. So okay. you, sh you ought to be able to share a picture right now. So this picture is um, when uh, um, Dr. King was in the Birmingham jail. And actually, my uncle, he took the picture. He snuck a small camera in, in his pant leg, and he was the one who actually took the picture. So he's got photo credit for taking that picture of Dr. King. And then he gave the camera to Dr. King and, and Dr. King took the picture of my uncle. So nice. we're very proud of that picture. I put them side by side just so you could see that they were both sure, in, sure. in the Birmingham jail at the same time. And this was due to the, uh, the, the Birmingham campaign, the Children's March where they decided that the children might have a better effect of uh, getting things done on that march than the adults who were maybe uh, worried about losing their jobs and things like that. Uh, Suzanne, what you may not know is that we had a uh, Reverend, uh, I'm not Reverend, Dr. Karen Savage on our last meeting and Dr. Savage, who has taught at Virginia Union for years and she also taught at Virginia State, a uh, wonderful uh, vocalist uh, is from Birmingham and was friends, very close friends with one of the young ladies who died in the bombing. And uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Savage and the young lady had shared their friendship rings. And the young lady who died had been decapitated and they identified her by Dr. Savage's ring on her hand. And uh, so when you mentioned the Birmingham, that's again, that connection between us. So let me ask you a question. Uh, I want, I'm glad I got, uh, Joanne and, and Michael back on. And here's a question. Uh, Reverend Walker was considered to be rather feisty, as I was told, and as I read. But the same thing is true for, for Dr. Curtis Harris, Reverend Dr. Curtis Harris. Dr. Curtis Harris didn't take much mess off, folks. I know we were nonviolent at CLC. But uh, Michael, do you all, you and Joanne, remember the fact that your dad was, I, I'm using the word feisty. You might find a better word to that to you. Tell us, tell us about your father. 
Look, what I remember of my father was, um, well, he wasn't, uh, I grew up knowing him to be uh, nonviolent, especially when he dealt with me. So, but I, you know, and what it was that I found out when I went about town, right, that he was uh, an individual who was a, a disciplinarian in his youth coming through high school and what it was that the way it was said to me by a lot of the older fellows in the city, uh, don't nobody mess with nappy. That's what they called it. And they said, don't nobody mess with nappy. And they said, won't go mess with me neither because I was nappy's son. Wow. So that was the word that I got. But from 1963, when we integrated the school system in Hopewell, my father was a staunch follower of Dr. King's nonviolent movement. Right. And that's what he expressed upon us in regards to us facing what we face and here in Hopewell in 1963. So, but uh, I, I, you know, I do, I, I just want to say this before, you know, uh, we, we get through because I wanted to say to Suzanne is that um, I don't have the picture, but my sister has that. I, it's a sister, it's a picture of uh, Dr. Harris and Reverend, and Reverend Walker at the assisted living place when they first met. And it was a glorious thing to see those individuals those two titans hooking back up together in their last days. And I know that it was just a month or so uh, between the time that both of them passed away. But I got a chance to sit with both of them and eat dinner and lunch when I came down to see them. And I got to sit with both of them. And that was amazing. That was an amazing mm -hmm. experience. So Joanne, I just to say that. Joanne, do you have a picture you want to share or something you're looking at like? Um... I was looking for, um, I wasn't prepared for all of this, but yeah, I got a couple pictures I can share. Um, so so while you're sharing that, let me also tell the uh, membership uh, and why you get that together. If you put it up on the screen, it's no problem. Um, we were going to interview uh, Suzanne's aunt. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. I like that. Wow. This was the March on, this was uh, Selma to Montgomery March. And. Um, Do you know who that is besides your father? Yeah, that's um, Ralph Abernathy. No, on, on the other side. Oh, now I don't know who that gentleman is. Okay, that's what I was saying. Yeah, I recognize Dr. Abernathy. And yeah. I think this is Mrs. Abernathy and Dr. King. Right. And I remember the day that he went off to uh, Selma for the mount, for the march. And um, you have another. One? I um I, I I know that we are. I I got I got a, another picture too. Um. But while you're doing that, let me finish what I was saying about. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, 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 Mrs. Teresa Walker. Uh, Reverend Dr. King, uh, Reverend Dr. Y.T. Walker's wife just celebrated 96th birthday, day 96, before yesterday. Yes. 96 years old on the 27th. And she's still here, living here in the Chesterfield area. And we were trying to get together to do an article, but it didn't happen. But I did get a chance to talk to her. And uh, and and she was lucid and she was yeah, it was she sharp. Was, Sharp as a tack. And she, no, you know, she was correcting uh, her son, uh, Wyatt Jr. She said, no, that wasn't it. So she 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 has her facilities. And at some point in time or another, we're going to try to make sure that we honor uh, Teresa Ann Walker. Is it, where was Mrs. Walker from? That's why I wanted to ask Teresa. She was born in Freehold, New Jersey. She was a New Jersey young lady. She grew okay. up there. She uh, ended up going to Virginia Union, which is where she met my uncle. See, that was the question I was asking. Where did they meet? They met at Virginia Union and um, they married in 1950. Uh, actually, we have a video of the wedding. We watched it when we went to see her for her awesome. birthday because my both my parents were um, there. My dad was in the army at the time, so he must have been home on 
leave or something to come to the wedding. They got married on Christmas Eve of 1950. Awesome. Awesome. Well, they, amazingly, see, my mother also went to Union. Um, and by them all being, well, she probably met uh, uh, Wyatt T. Walker before he was Reverend Doctor, even before. And if I'm not mistaken, Reverend uh, Dr. Curtis Harris went to Union also. Am I correct? Uh, That's Joanne right. and, yeah, he, he yeah. did go to Union. And Reverend Dr. Peterson on here is a Virginia Union, Virginia Union graduate also. I give Dr. Uh, Peterson. My brother, that. my brother's on here too, Brother Ryan Bell. Oh, yes. Ryan, Ryan came in in recent years. Uh, Ryan started uh, originator of the Y.T. Walker Foundation at Virginia Union. He, he He's done a lot of work. Uh, awesome. And and we're going to get him to, to work with us at SCLC to do more. Ryan, I got you on the spot because I've been begging to get you to work with us at SCLC. Ryan but, is out in Reno, man. Oh, is he? Okay. Okay. Well, I see it. we can still get it done, though. So well, go ahead. Go ahead, Miss Lucas. Uh, go ahead and share that picture with us while we're done. Dr. Lucas, I'm sorry. Um, this was in 1962. Um, Daddy had to go to court. And um, Dr. King came, and this is Milton Reed, Reverend Mil Milton Reed, that's in this, this, this newspaper picture. And Dr. King came and there were a hundred ministers that marched from Daddy's church in Hopewell down to the courthouse for his court hearing. So they came to walk with him that day. And um, Daddy, uh, Dr. King, when we had a restaurant at the time, Dr. King did go into our restaurant at uh, that particular day. But uh, we, we, we had to go to school. Mama made us go to school. And uh, she always said that she was sorry that she did that and didn't let us stay home to be a part of that. But so we didn't see Dr. King that day, even though he was in our restaurant and even though he was on our street and at our dad's church, we didn't see that. But that was uh, a big day. And this is when um, <laughs> they asked, uh, they asked uh, Reverend Reed to pray in the courtroom. And he prayed so long, he made the, uh, the judge uh, say amen because he <laughs> wanted that to be over kind of thing but uh awesome, awesome. Well, I, I want to just mention something about the legacy of virginia union my grandfather was born in 1870 and he was a student at shaw university and then he transferred to virginia state university and he finished at virginia union and oh. all of my father's siblings that went to college went to union and i was supposed to go but I saw Virginia State first. <laughs> and it's um, it was interesting to me later in life that I didn't realize the, the connection. I did my student teaching in Dinwiddie County and my grandfather actually lived in Dinwiddie. So there was some kind of draw for me to come to Virginia. But that's why most of our family went to Virginia Union because of my grandfather. And that uh, legacy. That legacy of, and it's a great school. I. It was. It almost had me, but Virginia State got me. <laughs> well, that's a that's amazing because I have a history at Shaw also, and uh, Dorothy Cotton also went to Shaw and then came to Virginia State because President Daniel came to Virginia State to teach from Shaw, and at that time she came to Virginia State and Miss Cotton uh, was uh, Reverend Doctor Walker's, of course, uh, uh, assistant administrative assistant, and she went to Atlanta with him. So let me ask you a question. Uh, we end our meetings on time. We got 10 minutes. Can I go around and uh, ask each one of you all if you have anything you want to say uh, to wrap it up? And I'm not going to do like they do it at service funeral services, where they tell you you got two minutes and you take five or 10. But I just just anything that you want everybody to know. Let's start with... Uh, uh, Mike, Mike, what is it that you want people to know about your father that we can, because this is being recorded, and we just want people to know years from now when we're gone, if they look back at this tape, and forgive me for not mentioning Reverend Milton Reed, because Reverend Reed was a part of that whole trial, that triad of, of ministers and leaders, and I wish we had more. I tried to get in touch with Andrew White today, but uh, 
Mike, give me a statement about your father before you go that you want everybody to know. Well, the statement that I'm making about my father is this. And it was a statement that was made at the unveiling of his statue on December 2nd. And one thing that Dr. Harris was about was being persistent and patient. Ah. Those were his mottos. That's what he worked by, lived by, and taught us about. And I would say that is something that right now is part of what keeps me going. Being persistent and also being patient. Well, we want to thank you for your service in Hopewell. Don't go anywhere yet. Stay on the screen. Uh, uh, Dr. Lucas, give us a statement about your father that you want. And and Mike, thank you for that, because I don't use that word patient enough. And and you just made, made it hit me in, it like, upside the head. Patience is a very important thing. Dr. Lucas, tell us more uh, something that you want us to remember your father about. Remember about your father. Because daddy was such a public figure figure and um, he had a stern exterior. I want people to know that my dad was uh, a fun loving and tremendous storyteller. And um, he was able to make that transition from being the Reverend doctor into being daddy very easily. He was he moved very quickly back and forth in those um, two kinds of categories because he had to be a father and a husband and a provider. And then he was a civil rights activist. I mean, a true civil rights activist. And I just want people to know more than anything that daddy had a lot of heart and a lot of love that he gave. And um, what I remember most about him doesn't have anything to do with the movement. What I remember most about him is that my daddy used to tell us stories. We never heard the three little pigs or we never, you know, heard the uh, fairy tales that everybody else had heard. Daddy made up our stories and the stories never had endings. <clears throat> and um, when he got tired of telling the story, he said, oh, about that time I got my cigar and went home. And so the story was over for the day, but um, a lot of love. And I wanted to know, um, I, 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 um, dad's papers as well as my mother's papers. And I want to mention her too, because my daddy would not have been who he was had he not had Ruth Jones Harris at his side, who also went to Virginia Union as well. And um, she made it so that he could do the work that he had to do. And that was his calling. In addition to his ministry at the church, it was his calling to be out there on the front line. So he was a strong guy, but he was a good guy. He was my dad. Awesome. And Suzanne, uh, give us uh, something about uh, your Uncle T that you um, would want everybody to know. Well, in addition to being a man of God, and he was a very strong in his faith person, he was also a scholar. He was very intellectually committed to excellence in the in scholarly pursuits, especially when it came to historical information about African-Americans. And he was a global leader and he visited more than a hundred countries. He was involved in, in, in uh, civil rights issues across the globe in, in many areas in Africa. Uh, he was you know, interested in the welfare of black and brown people across the world. And he started in his hometown and he made the difference wherever he went. And that's what I think is his legacy is that he was committed to excellence for uh, equal justice and the rights of our, our people. Awesome. Hey, Ryan, do you want to take a minute to say something to everyone if you would like to? Uh, if you can unmute your mic, go ahead and speak to, yes, sir. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I Dr. Walker, so I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Walker through through our fraternity uh, when I came into the fraternity in 2011, um, and Mrs. Walker as well. And uh, what I remember the most about Dr. Walker at that particular point in time in his life was he was the first man I saw um, be gentle, right? He was a very gentle spirit, a uh, very kind spirit, 
uh, I used to bring students from my school, Miles Jones Elementary School, and we would come over there three, four times a week, and he would sit there and tell these stories to these fifth graders, the same stories over and over and over again, and never made us feel like we were imposing on his time. Uh, and just with somebody who was, you know, a very humble and and uh, caring individual who I was turned on through by Dr. Alex B. James. So that's actually the first person, Dr. Alex B. James, who uh, introduced me to the name of Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. Um, and uh, I was actually just looking at some pictures the other day. My son, who's now eight, over in that uh, assistant living facility, uh, when he was probably at that time getting ready to turn two years old, um, and Dr. Walker sitting there showing him pictures and, uh, you know, talking to him as if he was, you know, a 42 year old man <laughs> in the movement. Right. So it was just a, a fun, loving person. And I counted a blessing and an honor that he gave me the opportunity to to recognize him in that way. And I still stay in touch with Mrs. Walker uh, as well. And uh, counted a blessing that 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 family came this way um, and gave us some of their time here on this space. All right. Thank you. Let me just say to everybody, one of the things that we do here at the Richmond chapter of SCLC is we start on time and we end on time. And it's one of the things that I put in place as, as a, one of the few things as a leader that I could do that get us out of the habit of starting late and going long. And, uh, and, and I think people can respect the fact that we start on time, we end on time, which I'm looking at my clock means I have about two minutes so to thank you all very much for coming and sharing with you your experience. You all had a chance to walk in the footsteps of history. It's not, you were right there in the middle of it. Uh, it people are reading about it now. Kids were amazed when I was uh, one of the administrators of public schools, the teachers clapped for me after I spoke to them and I asked them why. And they said, well, you talked about Dr. Martin Luther King because you were there. He's, they said most of these teachers weren't even born when Dr. King got killed. And that threw me for a loop because I just didn't, I, I, my perception was that. So right now, I want to thank each and every one of you, uh, General Walker, uh, the Honorable Michael Harris, and Dr. Lucas, thank you. I'd ask everybody at CLC to give you a, a round of applause by putting a little clap in the hand things up on the screen right now. I'm going to unpin you. We're going to we're going to end this meeting with a prayer real quick. And uh, Reverend Dr. Peterson, uh, can you give us not one of those uh, uh, Pentecostal prayers, but can you give us a prayer? Oh, that's a beautiful picture. Can you give us a prayer as we pray out? And we'll look at this picture as you do it, Reverend Dr. Peterson. Indeed, but just know that I um, I'm BUU made, but I'm VSU paid. All right. Well, God has increased my capacity to love both institutions. Amen. Amen. Pray us out of here, please. Lord, as we leave this space, we thank you for the time and the stories that were shared. We thank you, God, for the lessons learned and the inspiration gained. Now give us the strength to continue with diligence as we honor the struggles and victories of our past and march forward to a future of equality and justice for all. Bless us and keep us united in purpose. In Jesus' name, In amen. Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Ladies, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. This meeting is hereby adjourned. It is 8.30. Please consider joining SCLC. That's a beautiful picture. Please consider joining SCLC. And thank you very much for being here tonight. And thank you for those people who came and talked to us tonight. God bless you all. This meeting is hereby adjourned. And if you want to stay around just to listen to a little of this music I'm going to play, that's a wonderful thing. But the meeting is over at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you all for coming. And, and it was a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. All right. And if I could play the music, I'd be all right.